There are moments in history when the smallest inventions tell the biggest stories, and the Second World War is full of them. Troops fighting through snow-buried forests, frozen trench lines, or wind-blasted mountain passes didn't always have access to stoves, fuel, or reliable heat. Many armies were pushed beyond their supply lines, and sometimes the only thing between a soldier's fingers and frostbite was a crude little pouch tucked into a coat pocket. The real fascination comes from the fact that this wasn't some factory-perfect accessory. In many units it was improvised, the result of chemistry, practicality and desperation. And the idea behind it survived because it worked. Soldiers learned quickly that with the right blend of iron, salt, air and just enough moisture, they could spark a slow burn that kept their hands functional through bitter nights. This method didn't rely on technology. Only the understanding of a reaction anyone today can replicate. For those of you who tune into this channel, appreciating the often forgotten corners of wartime innovation, this is one of those fascinating tricks that really deserves a revival. Not only for the sake of historical appreciation, but also for its real-world usefulness today. So, how did soldiers discover that iron and salt could actually heat the body? Well, the key to this wartime method was the oxidation of iron. It's a reaction that, you know, humans have known about since the first rusting tools, yet rarely thought of as a source of warmth. How did soldiers come to realize that iron and salt could be used to heat the body? The secret to this wartime technique was indeed the oxidation of iron. It's a process that, quite frankly, we've been aware of since the dawn of rusting tools, but seldom considered as a heat source. Soldiers, especially those marching through Eastern Europe or stationed in high alpine regions, needed a heating method that consumed no precious fuel, produced no smoke, and could be carried in a pocket. Supply officers sometimes distributed small heating packets, but when shortages hit, field improvisation took over. Powdered iron was easy to source, because it often came from filing tools, scraping steel wool, or salvaging rusted equipment. Salt acted as a catalyst because it allowed the iron to oxidize faster, producing steady heat. Add a little activated carbon to help distribute warmth and a controlled amount of moisture to kick-start the process, and the reaction would maintain warmth for hours. What made this method so effective was its independence from external conditions. Soldiers didn't need a fire, matches, or even shelter. The heat was self-generated from a reaction that only required oxygen and ingredients that were often right at hand. That's why this method spread, not from official manuals, but through frontline knowledge, passed from soldier to soldier. So, how this formula actually works on a chemical level. Iron oxidizes when exposed to oxygen. When you accelerate that process, the reaction releases heat. Right, let's look again at how this formula actually works on a chemical level. Iron oxidizes when exposed to oxygen. And when you accelerate that process, the reaction releases heat. Salt helps break down the surface of the iron and increases the availability of ions that carry the reaction forward. Moisture provides the environment for ions to move freely. 
Activated carbon stabilizes heat and distributes it evenly. Even in World War II, soldiers didn't describe this in scientific terms, but they knew that when these ingredients were mixed in the right proportions and sealed in a breathable cloth or parchment wrapping, they produced reliable warmth. In modern materials like commercial hand warmers, the principle is almost identical. But, you know, the World War II method stands out because of its simplicity. No factory, no special additives, just chemistry at the most practical level. It reminds us that survival knowledge doesn't always look like elaborate equipment. Sometimes it looks like a handful of very ordinary materials working together in extraordinary ways. How you can recreate this method in a practical, safe way? Anyone wanting to apply this historical technique today can do it using safe, easily accessible materials. So, let's talk about how you can recreate this method in a practical, safe way. Anyone wanting to apply this historical technique today can do it using safe, easily accessible materials. If you have iron powder or steel wool, coarse salt, a pinch of charcoal and breathable fabric like cotton, you can recreate the process almost exactly as soldiers once did. Start by breaking down steel wool into as fine a material as possible. During the war, soldiers did this with pocket knives or file blocks, and you can do the same. Once you have your iron sauce ready, mix it with a small amount of salt and ground charcoal. The charcoal should be crushed into a fine powder so it blends evenly. Add just a few drops of water, enough to create slight humidity, but not enough to soak the mixture. This is crucial because too much moisture chokes out oxygen and stops the reaction. Wrap the mixture in a cotton cloth and tie it securely, making sure the fabric can still allow air exchange. The fabric serves as the oxygen filter that controls the rate of heating. When exposed to air, the reaction will begin slowly, reaching steady warmth within minutes. In survival contexts, campers and long-distance trekkers use this method to warm sleeping bags, boots, or small shelters. One practical example is to prepare several of these packets ahead of time, store them in airtight jars, and expose them to air only when needed. Another is using finer powder to create a faster reaction if immediate heat is required or coarser shavings for a slower, longer-lasting warmth. In survival contexts, campers and long-distance trekkers use this method to warm sleeping bags, boots, or small shelters. One practical example is to prepare several of these packets ahead of time, store them in airtight jars, and expose them to air only when needed. Another is using finer powder to create a faster reaction if immediate heat is required, or coarser shavings for a slower, longer-lasting warmth. Why this method remains valuable for survivalists today? This technique works in situations where fuel is scarce, fire isn't safe, or stealth is required. Hunters in cold regions still use iron-based warmers to maintain dexterity. Long-distance hikers carry them to prevent nighttime cold injuries. Even homeowners have used them during winter power outages to keep hands warm enough to perform tasks like opening frozen valves or handling tools. Quite handy, isn't it? 
The brilliance of the World War II method is that it gives anyone a compact, reliable heat source with nothing more than common materials and an understanding of how the reaction functions. It's really quite ingenious, don't you think? For survival enthusiasts, this isn't just history, it's a working tool. Mastering it means mastering a piece of knowledge soldiers once depended on to stay alive. It's fascinating how history can be so practical. If you enjoyed this deep dive into wartime thermal ingenuity and want more historical survival methods, subscribe to Thermal Vault and share this video with others who appreciate this kind of knowledge. Let's keep the spirit of discovery alive together.